This is uh, AlexNet, which we'll be studying quite a bit. So this is, uh, remember that was the first network that, um, 2012, that, you know, beat all the other non-network approaches in that uh, competition. So, and remember that these blue things, um, those are not system blocks, those are like signal blocks. They, they show essentially the shape of the signal at every layer in the network. So this is the input signal, which are images of 224 by 224 pixels, they're color, so they have three channels, red, green, blue. <coughs> The first layer um, is going to do, you could say it has three sub-layers. It has a 2D convolution with a bunch of kernels. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but I think you understand basically how 2D convolution works now. Then, like uh, we saw in the last unit, it goes through an activation, some nonlinearity like ReLU. And the, the other thing that happens in these convolutional neural networks is um, subsampling or pooling, which is something that's used to reduce the number of pixels as you go through the network. So you start with these 224 by 224 images, but after the first layer, notice that they have shrunk to 55 by 55. So uh, basically, each of these two dimensions, um, you took essentially like one out of every four samples to go from here to here. So you threw out three quarters in each dimension, or um, one out of 16 pixels, really. So you, you lost a lot in terms of the pixel resolution, but you went from three colors to, you could say, 96 colors. These are not colors that we humans can interpret, but the neural network can understand them. And there are um, various animals out there that can see with many more than three colors. So it is happens in biology too, but we, call, we don't get all these colors, we call them channels. So you would say that the input has three channels and that the features in the first layer have 96 channels. And these are design uh, things, uh, probably the creators of this tried different numbers of channels versus the layers and they settled on these. But overall what you tend to see in these networks is you start, so the number of channels in your input of course is not up to you, if you're dealing with color images it has to be three. But as you go through the network, you generally use more and more channels and fewer and fewer pixels. So eventually, by the, by the time they got there, they had 13 by 13 in the pixel domain, but 256 channels. And these are all convolutional layers with things like activation and the subsampling is responsible for the change in the number of pixels. Okay, then at this point, they essentially um, what we call flattened or unraveled this. You could, we call these tensors. I'll talk about it more in a second. But you can think of this as a, um, you know, it's like a, a 3D um, structure of, of, uh, of values. And you just, if you just kind of unravel that into a single vector, it's going to have 13 times 13 times 256 entries. And those features now go into um, this MLP. So this is just exactly what we saw in the last unit. So this is going to be, you're going to have a um, you know, matrix multiply followed by another ReLU, another matrix multiply followed by a ReLU, and so on. So this is exactly what we saw in the last unit. Non-convolutional, we call these dense layers. And then these are the convolutional processing here. The reason for the names, um, the name dense is that when you look at the matrices that are, are here, if you just looked at them, you'd notice that there's essentially non-zero values everywhere. When you look at a convolutional layer, you can write convolution as a matrix multiplication. And when you do that, you'll notice that this is, would be for a 1D convolution you'd notice that it essentially has a banded structure we call a toplets matrix. And so all these would be zeros out here. So this is not a dense matrix because it has tons of zeros in it. But th these would be dense matrices because they, they don't. So that's where this name comes from. Yeah? So um, if I'm thinking this correctly, like going from the, like the first layer, we basically have like 96 separate kernels 
that are each kind of like they're going to be trained eventually, right? Great question. So we're we're going there soon. Okay. But to answer your question, it will actually have three times ninety six different kernels. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. You have a separate kernel for every um, one of these and one of these. So you don't just have a two-dimensional kernel, like a three-dimensional kernel for that? You could think of it that way. If, there's different ways to think about it, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so basically let's just talk about tensors. This is really just some notation. A tensor is nothing more than a multi-dimensional array, and you've already been working with these um, so, for example, a matrix is just a two-dimensional array of numbers. That's an example of a tensor. A color image, uh, where you have, um, you know, the height, like you have a, cer a certain number of pixels um, corresponding to the number of pixels in the height of the image, the width, and the channel, where maybe the channel is red, green, blue. That's an example of a tensor. That would be a a uh, degree three tensor, this is a degree two tensor. Or we've also been talking about these. What if you have a batch of images? So each one of the images has a certain height, a certain width, certain numbers of channels, but then there's a whole batch of them. So there's another index over the batch. So that would be a four-way tensor. That's r what we're actually dealing with when we train things. Okay, so, um, and then just some terminology. So the number of dimensions, like this would be four, that's called the degree, or sometimes the order, or sometimes the rank. And by the way, when you talk about the rank of a tensor, like a generic tensor like this, it has nothing to do with the rank of matrices. Unfortunately, they use the same term, but they're unrelated. In fact, um, even talking about something like the linear algebra rank of a tensor is really difficult once you go beyond two dimensions. There's different ways to define it, but it's, it's much more complicated. Um, <clears throat> the shape of the tensor essentially tells you, it's the list of numbers that tell you the sizes of all those. So for example, if I have a 10 by 20 by four structure, then you would say its shape is 10, 24, and you'd say because there's three things, you'd say its degree is three. And I think you've already seen this with NumPy because in NumPy, if you do like something dot shape, it just, basically lists this, reports that. So you've already seen these, these ND arrays in NumPy, these are just tensors, and in PyTorch they're called dot tensor. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about exactly what happens in the convolutional layer. So the first thing is um, the weights of the tensor, which basically all the kernels together, you can think about it as a four degree tensor, degree four tensor. So the way that we organize them in PyTorch, and, and they have to be organized exactly this way, otherwise PyTorch misinterprets what you wanna do. Um, these four dimensions, um, or at least the shape would be the number of output channels for that layer, the number of input channels, and then the size of the kernel. So that would be the weights, those are the things, the parameters you're learning. You also have a bias for that layer, and the bias, all it does is it adds a single number to all the pixels for each of the output channels. So, um, so the bias vector is just a one-dimensional vector with C out elements, just one number for every output channel. Okay. So that's, that is basically what the weights are, the, the trainable weights, and the inputs are gonna have, they have to be um, configured this way. So the first element, or the first um, <clears throat> dimension is, is basically the batch dimension. So if, if you're just, if you have a single image, not like a whole you know, batch of training images, the dimension here would be one. Then you have the number of input channels. This is the input tensor, so this is the number of channels in the input. And then this is, these are just the number of vertical and horizontal pixels coming in. Um, and then the output tensor is going to be organized in a similar way. You're gonna have, this is the output tensor. <clears throat> I is gonna index into the batch. M is gonna index into the number of output. That's the output channel index. And then these are the spatial indices 
same as at the input. Okay, so here's what's actually happening. The way I like to think about it is, let's imagine we freeze a particular output um, channel and a particular input channel. So, so at that point, M and N are frozen. You can just sort of forget about them for a moment. All that's left is convolution. You can see what remains here is just convolution the way we saw it before. So when we think about every particular input channel, output channel pair, there's just a standard convolution happening there. Then for a, for a given output channel, you sum the results of the convolution over all the input channels. So let's come back to this picture over here. So as we said, one way to think about it now is there's, a, there's three times 96 different two-dimensional kernels. And if I want to ask, like, the very first kernel, what is it doing? It's the kernel that is essentially between the first channel here and the first channel here. There's also another kernel that's taking us from the second channel here to the first channel here, and a third one that's taking us from the third channel here to the first channel here. I might have said that wrong. So you have one to one, two to one, and three to one. So all those three kernels are going to affect what's happening in the first of these 96 channels. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take, you know, the red, convolve it with that kernel, add it to the green, convolve it with its kernel, and add that to the blue, convolve it with its kernel, which will give us what's in that very first channel. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you want to think about those three scalar kernels that are all contributing to this guy, you can think of them as a color one if you want because, you know, you could just say, well, those are the three colors of that kernel, and then we can plot them, and I'll show you plots of what they look like. Um, you can do that in the first, but you can't do that over here because we can't visualize 96 colors. But you can, you can kind of get an appreciation for how many kernels there are, right? So like to take us from here to here, we have 96 times 256 different kernels that we're training. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so this is, yeah, so that's basically the equation um, that we have for convolutional layers. So this is a super important equation. Um, really want to be able to understand this. And... The way that I understand it again is for the moment, you know, at first I just say let's fix M and N. Then when you look at what else is there, that's just a standard two dimensional convolution, which I think we can understand. And now if I fix M and consider there's C in different convolution results, all I'm going to do is just add them all together to find what's in the nth output channel. And I do that you know, for every of my C out output channels. This whole operation happens identically for every batch index I. So the batch index is not very important. It appears here in the outputs, here in the inputs. Uh, the kernels themselves are not dependent on the batch, right? They're the same kernel is applied to every batch element. Um, and then here, this is just that bias term, which is just a different scalar applied to all the pixels um, but it's a different one for every output channel. Okay, so that's essentially what, what convolutional layers do. There's a nice visualization um, of what's, what's happening. Um, former student sent me this link. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm not going to spend time on it here in, in the lecture, but if you want to click on this, it, it gives sort of a different way of understanding this uh, that might be useful to you. <coughs> Okay, any questions on what's happening here in convolutional layers? Yeah. So we're basically trying to make the network learn the kernel. The network learns all the kernels. It, it needs, it's doing this, it has some overall task. It could be classification. And the kernels, you know, of the first layer are affecting the features of that first layer. And those features are going through the kernels of the second layer. And, Finally, they're all affecting the output, and they all have an effect on the output. And we're trying to train them all together jointly, all to be a good classifier. Yeah, but it's like uh, when you explain the examples, 
something. Yeah. They, there we knew what we wanted to do. Yes. And now we don't, so we have to plan the answer. Exactly, yes. In those examples, we were told what the kernels are. Now we're trying to learn the kernels. <clears throat> okay, so again, I would like to talk a little bit about the PyTorch ordering convention. So PyTorch very specifically wants the weight tensor to be organized this way, number of output channels, number of input channels, and then vertical, horizontal. And it wants the input tensor to be organized this way, batch index, channel index, vertical, horizontal. And the output tensor is organized the same way, except instead of number of input channels, you have number of output channels. Now, when you look at what's happening in SK image, it actually it wants a different ordering convention. Um, so first of all, it doesn't work with batch elements. It, doesn't, you know, it's not trying to train anything, so it's not working with batches. So um, when you have a color image, its framework or its format is height, width, channel. Okay, so when you, and, and maybe this is how you start. Maybe you load in your data in SK image, and later you want to apply it in PyTorch. You have to do some juggling to get the formats you know, to work with each other. So you're going to have to take what's in this location, and you're going to have to move this to the front so that you can do that in NumPy with the transpose command. Um, and then you're also going to have to add this index. So even if you have just a single batch element, you know, you, a batch size of one, because we're going to do a simple experiment, you can't give PyTorch a three-way tensor because it's going to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. I only know about four-way tensors. And so what you'll have to do is you'll just have to reshape that three-way thing as a four-way thing, and it will append it will append an extra dimension to the front that will have size one. So now it knows that this is a four-way tensor, not a three-way tensor. And now it knows how to deal with it. <clears throat> so we'll see that in the examples. But I just want to kind of emphasize that you have to, you know, for these different... Um, Toolboxes, you have to speak their languages. Otherwise, of course, you get completely the wrong results. Okay. Um, all right. So, any questions? Any more questions on convolutional layers? Okay. So, let's move on to the next idea. So, we said that, um, okay, 2D convolution is one thing that happens. Activation, we talked about activation. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but not right now. Um, but we talked about like the ReLU activation, which looks like this. This is really good for deep networks because it, um, it avoids the vanishing gradient problem that you would get with a sigmoid or TANH network. Let's talk about subsampling and pooling, which are the ways that we reduce size. Here we went from 224 by 224 to 55 by 55. Later we'll reduce size by another half, again by another half, and so on. So there's basically three popular ways to do that. In all cases, you're pruning the number of pixels. You're just trying to shrink the size of the image in the spatial domain. <clears throat> and so the simplest one is known as subsampling. So it's like this. You have an image. I'll draw just a very small uh, four by four image. And what you say is that in each one of these regions, so this will be a two by two region, you just say, I'm going to keep the top left pixel, and I'm going to throw the others away. So I'm going to, I'm going to by doing this, I'm going to shrink from something that had 16 pixels to have something that has four. Okay, so that's subsampling. Um, and this, this size two by two, here they call that the stride. But the stride actually has a slightly different meaning um, which it's the right way to think about stride is by how, how far you shift this to the right or down. So here the stride is two because this little two by two window, you're shifting it to the right by two, then you're shifting it down by two, and so on. So that's what the stride is, is how much you shift it. <clears throat> so this particular operation, subsampling, because you know what you will keep and you know what you will throw away, 
it doesn't make sense computationally to, to compute these convolutional outputs, because remember this is happening after convolutional, your convolutional layer. It doesn't make sense to compute those outputs if you know you're going to throw them away. So this is implemented together with convolution in a smart way so that when you do the convolution, it just simply only computes those outputs and it never computes the other ones. That way you're not wasting any multiplies. Okay, so this is, so it's implemented as part of convolution. It's not like a separate thing, a separate little block that you would load from your PyTorch library. It's actually something you specify when you specify your convolutional layer. <clears throat> okay, so, um, okay, any questions on the subsampling idea? It's just a crude way of, of subsampling your image, making it, you know, um, a lot smaller. And in signal processing, like if you took 5200, maybe 3050, I don't know, this is called downsampling. Is there a relationship between like, the kernel, how much it's shifting, or what its size is, size is relative to the... Th there is for these pooling, which I'll talk about in a moment. But for this, there's not. I like it's, they're fixed. So if, if you have, um, if I had like a three by three, then I would shift it over and that would be three by three. So it's just like, you can't independently specify the size of this and the shift. So the subsampling is taken then <clears throat> from the kernel, like the dimensions of the kernel? Oh, the kernel size is so totally separate. Okay. The, the kernel size can be as big or small as you want. So this is just saying like which of the pixels coming out of the convolution will you keep and which will you throw away. Yeah, kernel size can be anything. <clears throat> okay, so now, but maybe you'll see what I was trying to say with max pooling. Rather than just keeping, let's say, the top left pixel of every region, you keep the largest value no matter where it is. So you would perhaps look over this square and you'd look at the four values and whichever is largest, that's the one you keep. And then you look over this square and whichever is largest of those four, that's the one you keep and so on. <clears throat> that's called max pooling. Um, and there's also average pooling, which is just to say, you just take the average of all those pixels, you, you report the average, you take the average of these and so on. Now, with both max and average pooling, you actually can decouple how much you shift, which is the stride, from the size of the region that you do the max or the averaging over. So I'll show you an example here. <clears throat> so um, on the top, this would be when you have k equals 2. k is the size of the window. Here, k equals 3. And the shift, or the stride, is 2 in both cases. OK, so what we're going to do here is this is my little two by two region, k by k, or two by two region. I'm gonna look for the maximum pixel here, which is obviously five, report that. Then I shift over, so my stride is two, so I move this to the right by two. I look at the maximum there, which is four, I report that. And then I also go down by two, because my stride, s is two. I report four and so on. Now, I could have had a three by three window. And in this case, when I look over the max here, it's still five, but I could have a stride that's only two, which means I shift this down only by two. See so here I can have a stride that's different from the window size. Here too, I shift to the right by two, not three. So I can have, uh, these, these values can be different. Okay, so we have a K by K region and a stride of S. And this last one is called, um, in signal processing, it's called decimation. If you've taken 500, maybe 3050 talks about it too, for sure. 500 talks about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, and when you do this, you do this, you do this on every channel, on every batch item. It just um, so and independently on every channel, meaning that you know, if in one channel this was the largest element, then in the next channel. Maybe a different one is the largest element. So it's, you know, it just depends on the values in each channel. Okay, so that's subsampling. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay, so let's come back to our picture here. So part of the reason we're doing this subsampling is that just sort of intuitively, we start out with this big image, but at the very end, we don't have images at all. We have classes, like these are the thousand classes in, in ImageNet, right? So we somehow have to go from the world of images, you know, to the world of no images and classes. And so what we're doing here is we're just gradually making the image size smaller and smaller until at some point what's over here don't even have an, uh, you don't even think about them as images anymore because there's no more horizontal and vertical pixels. Just lists of numbers. And the numbers somehow have meaning when you think about classes. So gradually you, you go from here to here by reducing the size of the number of pixels, reducing spatially. But if, if that's all you did, you would, um, you would not have enough information. You, here you, you just need to collect a lot of different features. So to combat the loss of spatial size, you increase the channel size. So it's like you're trading off from a lot of pixels, few channels, to less and less pixels, more and more channels. Okay, so that's why we're doing this. Anyway, last thing to talk about are the dense layers. Essentially, these are exactly what we have seen in the previous unit. So the last convolutional layer will report a tensor of this shape. So batch elements, number of output channels, um, pixels by pixels. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to flatten this into, we're going to flatten this stuff into a vector. We're still, we're going to do this separately for every batch element. So we're going to now get, you could say a matrix where we have elements in a batch and um, just a certain number of, of new elements where the number of elements in this vector is just this three-way tensor, you know, flattened. So C out times N1 times N2. Okay, and then um, the, the, uh, the dense layers or the linear layers, they look exactly like what we saw in the last, the last unit. So here's our matrix W, um, and this is our activation it has two indices because there's a batch index and then there's the index across the different um, hidden nodes. So these are like the input nodes, these are the output nodes. So, you know, so basically when, as you're going through your network, actually this tensor changes from a degree four tensor to a degree two tensor at the stage where your network transitions from convolutional layers to dense layers. Okay. So it's just, exactly like we saw in the last unit. Um, flattening is the, that reshaping option, operation. So how do we decide the number of convolutional layers? That's a great question. So we'll talk about the history. Um, at the beginning, they, they wanted to make it deeper and they faced problems and this was kind of as deep as they could go, but it was very deep at the time relative to what came before. And then we'll see that uh, using various tricks and things, they were able to make them more deep because that they, they found that that was working better. But we'll have to, we'll go through all the tricks. We'll go year by year and see the advances they made and exactly how things progressed. <coughs> yeah. Eventually, nowadays, you can do this with thousands of layers if you want. Depth. It's possible. Okay. All right. Any other? Questions? Okay. All right, so let's talk about why are we doing convolution? Why not just do dense, dense uh, layers everywhere? And a lot of it has to do with um, they're much more efficient. If you count the number of parameters or count the number of multiplies you have to do, they're orders of magnitude more efficient. So let's look at just an example. Let's look at the second layer of AlexNet. So not the very first one, but the second one. So in the second one, we're going from something that has 96 channels and a 55 by 55 spatial, you know, pixels to something that has 256 channels and 55 by 55. We will eventually do pooling to shrink this dimension, like max pooling. But for now, we're just focusing on the convolutional part 
which doesn't actually, we're doing the same mode convolution, so we're, we're having the same image size, but we're growing the number of channels. And here I have stars for the batch. The, it doesn't really, what we're talking about on this page, it, it, it holds for any batch size, so it's not important. Okay, so let's think about a convolutional layer. How many weights and how many biases do we need? So um, <clears throat> remember that in a convolutional layer, you can say that there's a, a single kernel for each one of these 96 channels and each one of these 256, there's a single kernel, and that kernel is going to be a k by k. Right? So the total number of parameters would be 96 times 256 times k1 times k2. Right? So this is the total number of parameters that we have to learn in this convolutional layer. Is that making sense? Where we got that number? Right? So it's every kernel has k1 times times k2. They're usually square, but in general, they could be rectangular. So k1 times k2, and then c out times cn, because that's the number of kernels we have to design. <coughs> the number of biases is, is, is not a big deal. It's c out, which is 256. OK, so in AlexNet, in the second layer, they use 5 by 5 kernels. And so if you, if you plug in 96 times 256 times 5 times 5, you get 600,000 different weights, and 256 different bias coefficients. <clears throat> okay, sounds like a lot, but let's look at what happens if instead of a convolutional layer, we would have used a fully connected layer, a dense layer. So now, <clears throat> the way to think about that is you have to flatten everything. So essentially, this is like a matrix multiply. Um, so the size, the number of coefficients at the input is going to be it's going to be um, this right for every let's say for every batch element I'm going to have cn times n1 times n2 different elements that I need to put through my dense layer is that making sense okay and then oops I meant to erase OK, and then how many output elements? How many here? It's actually not square. It's, it's, it's tall. Um, so that is going to be this, C out times N1 oops, times N1 times N2. OK, so how many coefficients are now in the matrix? How many coefficients are in there? Exactly. It's this number times this number. Okay. And so that is this number, C out times Cn times N1 squared times N2 squared. And if you multiply those things together, you get 200 billion weights compared to 600,000. 600,000 is doable. 200 billion in that one layer is not doable. Okay. Way too many. Um, even the number of biases is kind of crazy. So this is why, in some sense, you could say you're forced to use convolutional layers rather than fully connected layers. Um, they're just so much more efficient, not only in terms of the number of weights, but if you, if you also think about the number of multiplies because to compute let's say you know the first element in that output vector you have to do all of those weights times all of these that's just a lot of multiplies so from the perspective of memory and um, parameters which has a uh, effect on overfitting and all that stuff as well as computation convolutional layers are just way way more efficient they're also translation they have this transla translational invariance idea, which is the whole you know, pattern matching idea. This little pattern that we're searching for could be anywhere in the image. So it makes sense to have a small kernel that I can move around everywhere. Um, convolution just makes sense as, as something that we might want to do with um, like visual processing. And we said it's actually what happens in our brains too. So biologically, we've evolved to, to use the same tricks. Okay. All right, so any... Any questions on this page, convolution? 
Okay. Um, all right, so <clears throat> let's talk about, um, just quickly about um, implementing some of this stuff in, in Python. So this is the code to do the edge detection stuff. So let's see. So this is, this is how we would do it in, in PyTorch. We already saw how to do it in, um, in SciPy signal. OK, so we have to set things up for the right sizes in PyTorch. So let's establish how many images we're working with, That's basically like how many images are in our, in our batch, just one, just this guy. How many input channels? Grayscale, so it's one. So the batch shape is going to be like this, number of images, comma, number of channels, comma, number of rows, number of columns. And number of rows and number of columns we can get from im.shape. Um, and it's, that's 512 by 512. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take this im, this is our image, we're going to reshape it according to this four-way tensor size. And so originally the image was just a 5 by 512 by 512 matrix. Once you reshape it, it's this four-way tensor that has shape 1, 1, 512 by 512, right? So it, it takes the same num amount of memory to store it. It's just like now PyTorch knows that this is a four-way tensor, whereas if you just gave it something that's 5, 512 by 512, it would, it would not be able to know what to do with it. It'd be like, well, you only told me two of the four dimensions. You know, what are the rest? <clears throat> okay. So creating convolutional layers. Um, <clears throat> okay, we know how to create them in NumPy. So then what we, the way that we work with PyTorch is we could start by building um, a, convolu a 2D convolution. So this is the neural network library in PyTorch. When we create this, instantiate this, we have to tell it how many input channels, how many output channels, and what's the kernel size. So we're going to do both of these simultaneously in one layer. So number of input channels, since it's a grayscale image, will be one. But we're going to have two output channels because we're going to get the two different gradient operators. The kernel size is just going to be 3 by 3. <clears throat> we can do that by gx.shape. OK, so now we have this thing that's uh, instantiated in PyTorch. And when you do this in PyTorch, it just randomly initiates it randomly initializes all the weights and the bias. So what we're going to do next is we're going to extract them from the model using this state dictionary thing, model.statedictionary. Then we unpack them from the state dictionary. The weight, we'll call it W. The bias, we'll call it B. And then we're going to replace the values in W and B with these GXs. But of course, we have to convert GX from NumPy to a torch tensor. And then this is we're going to stick this into... This, these are our two different output channels, and they both have the same. There's only one input channel. And we're going to replace all the other elements with that 3 by 3 matrix. And we do that for these two different output channels. We're going to use bias of 0. We, we don't want to shift the image at all. So now we have things set up in W and B. Now we've got to put them back into our state dictionary. And we've got to load the state dictionary back into the model. And now the model's set up. Now we're ready to process the data. Because the data is the right size and it's a torch tensor, our model will know what to do with it. We just It's as simple as this. And then what comes out is going to be um, a tensor that has two different images. And one of them will be the um, vertical edges. One is the horizontal edges. In order to plot it, we have to bring things back to NumPy with this detach. But finally, when we're back in NumPy, we can yeah, then we need to convert from this, these four-way tensors back to two-way you know, matrices that we can plot. And we get these images just like we would expect. And these are exactly the same ones we got from Correlate 2D, not from Convolve 2D, right? Because we're actually doing correlation, not convolution. Even though PyTorch calls it convolution, it's really correlation. OK. So then um, <clears throat> I'll save this uh, for next time. There's, we can do a more sophisticated example where we have a color image. We want to have four different output channels. And each one, we essentially want to uh, convolve this with a red kernel, 
with a green kernel, with a blue, with a pink one. And we'll see how we can do that in, uh, in PyTorch. Out of time for today, so um, see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>